You're listening to the Really Useful Podcast, the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley and joining me is Gavin Phillips. How are you doing, Gavin? Doing very well, Christian. Looking forward to getting stuck into this week's round of news, views and tips. Excellent. Me too. There's just one thing, though. I stumbled across this madness, this insanity the other day. I was listening to a podcast called The The Retro Hour, which is a podcast for retro gamers. And uh, they shared this about a guy who has... Uh, basically found a way of loading software onto a Nintendo Wii U using a mini disc. That sounds amazing. Yeah, this is a YouTube channel called Will It Work? And he basically connects a Sony mini disc to a Nintendo Wii U to see if the mini disc can be formatted by the Wii U. And it can. It can be formatted as a hard drive. It's insane. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. It's bonkers. It's just utterly balmy. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get that in there because I'm a big fan of Minidisc. Um, it's my kind of my favourite. I'm, I'm, I'm my favourite. I, I, I was going to say my favourite audio format is probably vinyl, but actually I think it actually is Minidisc. Uh, I, I, they, it, it kind of, Minidisc came along at exactly the right time for me, type of person who wanted to grab onto it. So I've got quite a few Minidiscs knocking about. I uh, I no longer have a mini disc player, but uh, I similarly when it launched, um, it was quite incredible just for the change it made to how much music you could take around with you portably, yeah, and the audio quality that it suddenly gave you versus a CD. But it was also so like the recording options you suddenly had with, yeah. um, so for me. I used to be record um, PlayStation 2 soundtracks straight onto a mini disc player through the optical out on a PlayStation oh, 2. Oh, smart. Which was just brilliant because yeah. there were so many good soundtracks. And if you left your like pause menu open, it would play through a whole soundtrack. So you could you could easily pick up the whole soundtrack and then take it with you, which was just so cool. And, and the if, format itself was great. Yeah. And of course, it's very difficult to make a mini disc jump on like a CD. And the sound quality is miles better than cassette. Yes, absolutely brilliant. I, I loved it. It's a shame it sort of drifted off with the advent of uh, MP3 players, really, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was, it was. But uh, there's still people out there using it. So uh, if you are one of those or you know someone who was, then uh, that might be something interesting to show them. We're going to crack on now with some tech news. And the, um, the we're going to start with uh, VPN service, Proton VPN. This is a VPN service that is based in Switzerland. And uh, they're very keen on the whole privacy aspect of it, so much so that they are beyond the uh, reach of um, government uh, surveillance services, uh, alliances such as the Five Eyes Network. Proton VPN is um, launching a browser extension for its paid plan supporters only. This seems to be a, a common pattern among VPN providers at the moment. They're adding browser extensions now this is good they're offering new features but i feel gavin that browser extensions kind of give people a false sense of privacy they can do can't they because yeah. you're not um protecting all of the data that comes from your computer in the same way that a, a regular vpn would are you no that's right it's uh, basically protecting the data that you're finding through the browser rather than, you know, any online games that you're playing or uh, emails, probably not a huge concern, um, torrenting, bit torrenting, um, individual apps might not, such as like, there might be a streaming app on your computer that does rely on the internet connection through the browser, but it probably doesn't. So it's only going to keep private what you're using through your browser, which might be all that you need. But uh, it's a shame that there isn't a better way of doing this, really, that, that it can't extend beyond the browser. But then again, that's what, that's what desktop clients are for. Uh, so the VPN extension will be available for Google Chrome, Chromium, more or less the same thing. Mozilla Firefox, as well as LibreWolf and Waterfox. Microsoft Edge, again, almost the same thing as Chrome. Uh, Brave, Opera, and Vivar. I mean, most of them are based on Chromium these days. Uh, but the free, plan, <laughs> <laughs> the free plan does not offer the extension feature, um, which is good if you're paying. It's not so good if you're free. A Pro and VPN's free plan is quite good as well, so it's a bit, it's a bit of a shame that they haven't included that, because I think... I, I would like... 
to be in a world where Proton VPN is more um, is a mo is more obvious choice for VPN use. But uh, we live in a world where sort of NordVPN and ExpressVPN and CyberGhost and these companies with huge uh, budgets for promotion are the kind of more popular VPNs. But Proton VPN has a, a better ethos, I think, than they do. Yeah, certainly their overall approach to uh, privacy seems to be one of the best in the business. I wouldn't necessarily disparage the other companies that have been mentioned there. Some of them do have slightly um, iffier pasts than others. And also, um, I would say, uh, again, some of the other ones you've mentioned there have been through multiple rounds now of... Um, of auditing to yes. ensure that the things that they do say like we don't log and our servers are in specific locations and so on and so forth have actually been confirmed whereas a lot of the sort of lesser known vpn services will um can't really comply to that same level of uh, auditing so uh although yeah proton vpn is definitely one of the best um a lot of those other ones mentioned are also, I'd say, I would say at least as good these days. Yeah, sure. We'll move on now. Uh, this might be a little bit concerning for you, but it, on the other hand, it might just be a bit of a storm in a teacup, really. Acronis, the uh, software provider who do advanced security tools, um, email security tools, advanced backup, file sync and sharing tools, and recovery tools, uh, they have apparently or allegedly been hacked uh, by a cracker called, um, what is he called? Uh, he's called Kernelware. Kernelware, thank you very much. Who claims to have taken 12.2 gigabytes of stolen files from Acronis, which is detailed as certificate files, command logs, system configuration, system information logs, archives of the file system, Python scripts for an Acronis database, and backup configuration, plus screenshots of backup operations. But Acronis say this hasn't happened. And uh, on Twitter, the CISO, um, as person in charge of security at uh, Acronis, says, based on our investigation so far, the credentials used by a single specific customer to upload diagnosis data to Acronis support have been compromised. We're working with that customer and have suspended account access as we resolve the issue. It's a strange one, isn't it? It is a That's a lot one. of data to claim to have, only for it to be, like, not the data that it, you're saying it is. Yeah, so it's a tricky one as well in the sense that 12 gigabytes of data sounds like a lot, especially if it was just purely records. It would be quite a substantial amount. But if it all relates to one person, which is what uh, Mr. Reed is, is claiming here, and he also goes on to say no other system or credential has been affected. There is no evidence of any other successful attack nor is there any data in the leak that is not in the folder of that one customer. So the yeah. amount of data, this is how I'm reading it anyway, is that the amount of data relates specifically to that individual that was using a Cronus backup yeah. uh, and their specific set of logging credentials, as they are saying, has been breached, um, which could lead it to more be something like it was an individual a targeted attack uh, rather than something that has breached Acronis's like general security. So the company hasn't themselves been breached, but an individual account has. But even that can be enough to get the pigeons flying, can't it? Which is what we're kind of seeing here with this with this article. Yeah, that's pretty much what I thought happened as well. It's quite a strange thing to. Uh, I mean, surely if you if you're a hacker with um, previous for hacking Acer, you would know that the data that you've um, stolen would be limited to a particular user. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, Colonel wears 15. Oh, could be. I mean, anything like that can happen these days, can't it? Well, yeah. You think can. back to some of the court cases we've seen with very, very uh, young adults, well, teenagers, yeah, being taken to court uh, and flown across the seas from America to the US and the uh, sorry to the UK. Where? And, <laughs> yeah, and, that's a long the UK, trip, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all the way around the globe, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. But you, like you said, sometimes it may may not realise exactly what they've actually got their hands upon. But who knows? <laughs> Uh, 
And we're going to stay with the topic of cybercrime and discuss a keylogger. Uh, keyloggers aren't good. They're basically pieces of software that record what you've typed. And one particular keylogger that's doing the rounds at the moment is a piece of malware called the Snake Keylogger. And, well, as I say, it records what you're typing. It's spread through phishing campaigns. Those are uh, scam emails, usually, malicious links, attachments. It can also be sent via SMS and social media posts. It gets downloaded as an attachment to your computer, and that's a, a sort of a DocX Word or other type of word processing document. Get saved to your computer with a macro. That's a small piece of software that runs in another piece of software. Such a, um, it, For instance, if you use Microsoft Excel, you can uh, create macros that will also fill things for you, things like that. And uh, macros work in other Office software. Um, so basically, to cut a long story short, Snake Keylogger is distributed as a macro in a document file, and then it sits on your computer, takes uh, screenshots, and records everything you type in that order. Now, you might think, well, that's not very interesting, but, of course, everything you type includes passwords and usernames, and that's where you've got a problem, isn't it, Gavin? It absolutely is, yes. Uh, and with any sort of keylogger, including Snake Keylogger, the issue is, obviously, it, it can get into absolutely... Anything that you type, any account that you believed to be safe uh, could be under threat. Um, interestingly, Snake Keylogger has been rated as, I think, it's one of the most, well, it's on the checkpoint uh, most wanted malware list, <laughs> which is uh, where they list. Ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's on this, like, so they're top rated malwares that they see used around the entire world. Um and Snake Keylogger is, is one of the top ones on that list because it's extremely simple to use um, but extremely effective at what it does. Now, the great thing about this um, Keylogger is that it's not very well, uh, I suppose, not very well written. It's not very well... It's not very good at hiding, basically. Because uh, if it's uh, installed on your system, then you're likely to find that your computer overheats or slows down or keystrokes are... Uh, not input straight away, the system crashes or the software closes, and some things that you type may not even appear on your screen. We have a link to removing Snake Keylogger should you find that you have been infected by this malware. But I think probably the most important thing is to ensure that you don't click attachments from unsolicited senders and that you're using good email security software to detect such malware basically. I think email security software has kind of fallen by the wayside, hasn't it, over the past few years since webmail has taken off, but a lot of spam and dodgy emails are getting through webmail, I've noticed recently. Yeah, absolutely. And with any sort of uh, malware like this, email is always uh, the, the way it's going to end up on your computer. It will be through a phishing email, um, and if you're really unlucky, it'll be a spear phishing, a more targeted email. That's normally for a more uh, high value individual. So if you're working up high up in a business or whatever, and um, someone wants to get into your computer, they'll you know specifically target you. Yeah. The more general um, email security, though, I do think there is value in a obviously keeping your antivirus up to speed all the time. We've talked about on this show before that for most people, Windows security is is probably more well enough for everybody. Um, but if you want to go the extra hog, I always advise uh, Malwarebytes Premium um, subscription. It doesn't cost a great deal, and it does give you the extra layer of protection against anything that you may download by accident. Good advice there. Uh, information about this can be found in the show notes, along with anything, along with everything else that we've talked about in this week's really useful podcast. We're going to move on now. I came across this a few days ago, this whole problem. Uh, my dad has been with Virgin Media, which is kind of the UK's fastest fiber internet provider um for years 20 25 years he's been with them and he was very close to leaving but he was worried about losing his email address which he's had for years he's had it for so long he's it's it's an ntl world email address which is the email address that virgin media you know they changed the name to virgin media from ntl world so you know it's he's had it since about 97 i think 97 98 that sort of time and he didn't want to leave because he didn't want to lose his email address which is sort of like tied to him 
and all, all of his accounts, all that sort of thing. And it, it got me thinking, you want to change an ISP, but you don't want to lose your emails. You might have changed your name and want your email address to reflect this, or your email address might be really embarrassing and you want to change it. And if you change your email address, this can be really difficult. If your ISP is not able to change your email address for you, then that's a problem. If your online email provider isn't able to change your email address for you, it's also a problem. So there are many reasons why you might need to change your email address. And there's, uh, we'll go into, uh, have a little chat about this in a moment. I'm going to give you quickly a rundown of the eight steps you need to, to change your email address. First of all, create a free online email account. Second, change any online accounts that you have Link to the old email address to the new email address. In the old email address account, set up forwarding so all emails go to the new email address. Also create an autoresponder. Instructions for how to do these two things will be found with your uh, current email provider. And that autoresponder will send um, a message to your recipients, anyone who emails you, telling them to go to your new email account, depending on how you word it. Uh, you should manage and export your contacts or so delete any old contacts and export the ones you want to keep and import them into your new email account. Inform your contacts as well. Uh, maybe do that initially and then again in a couple of weeks just to make sure and save important emails. These can also be exported and imported or just archived and then delete other emails and close the account. It's a lot of bother, isn't it? A lot of things are really easy to do these days, but this isn't. That is a lot of steps, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. When you think about how easy it is to change some other things in your life, especially like in the UK, if you want to change something like your bank account, it does everything for you now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, all your direct debits and everything. And I know that's not necessarily the same deal state side, but wow. So it's that difficult. And this is actually interesting because this is not really a question I've had to think about or for a very long time now i've had two email addresses that i use and the idea i imagine as your dad went through of losing either of those but it's actually kind of terrifying in some yeah ways. yeah totally yeah i mean it's and emails kind of i mean i mean i don't want to get sort of like pretentious about this but emails if you've had an email account for that long it kind of tells a big story of your life doesn't it i mean my dad was employed when he started this email account and since then, he's become retired, welcomed a daughter-in-law into his family. He's had grandchildren, you know, so there's all these things have happened. Um, he's lost he's lost siblings over the, that period of time as well. So there's been email conversations about people being unwell, photographs of people that are no longer with us. It's And it's all in this email account. It's, it is quite, uh, it is really kind of scary for a lot of people, I think, to uh, consider parting with, with that trove of information without you know going through these steps first which is quite a bit of effort oh yeah absolutely i know the amount of times as well i've gone through uh emails looking for something that i thought i'd archived or saved and then realized i'd probably actually just deleted it in a big clear out when oh uh, yeah the inbox or whatever says you've got a thousand new emails or something <laughs> similar <laughs> and you go through and you click you know delete 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 and then realize that you've you've deleted something that you probably wanted to keep uh, and there's no way back, obviously, because yeah. once, yeah. once it's gone, it's gone. So doing this uh, in the methodical way set out by this article, I think, is a really good way of approaching it. So you'll find that in the show notes. Uh, Gavin, artificial intelligences and chat GPT. We've talked about this a few times. It seems to be uh, quite a popular topic on the Really Useful podcast. So we've got a couple of things to talk about on along these lines now uh, first of all i think a lot of us have seen this offer of a chat gpt windows client i've seen it on facebook as an advert oh have you i have oh interesting so i i haven't seen that i read uh the the report that was released by a security company uh kaspersky that first said about this but i'd not actually seen adverts for this in the wild so that's quite interesting that you've seen them specifically i have but the fact is, there isn't a chat GPT Windows client, is there? Well, no, that's what makes this thing so interesting, <laughs> is that there is no chat GCP, uh, GPT desktop client. And as far as I'm aware, there's no, there, there isn't one in the works either. Um, so what, I, what, why is that, though? Uh, why isn't there one? Yeah. Um, I don't know specifically why there isn't one at the moment. Um, it's all browser-based at the moment, isn't sure. it? Yeah. Um, 
ChatGPT or well, the company who runs ChatGPT, OpenAI, haven't given any signal that they are developing one. The browser-based version, I imagine, gives them greater control over what ChatGPT does because all of the back end is still on their servers rather yeah, than yeah. having to transport at least some part of it to your computer in an executable that you you know download and install. Uh, and for now, there doesn't seem to be any requirement for a desktop version of chat GPT. Like it might come with more features eventually in the long run, but right now integration into other services like we've seen with Microsoft's Bing search, which has now got a chat GPT, well, open AI powered function in it. And we've seen uh, Google Bard as well, which didn't work so well on its first run out, but will eventually get better, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, the long and the short of it is uh, that there is no ChatGPT desktop client, and the adverts that uh, Christian and others have seen on Facebook and other social media platforms is actually a link to a Trojan malware. Um, so it gives you a false link on social media that says you can download... Uh, the new version of ChatGPT, uh, new desktop client. We're trialing it. If you download using this link, you get uh, a new account, a new ChatGPT account, and we'll give you $50 or something uh, as a lure to to your new account, and you can use the premium version of ChatGPT, and you'll be one of the first. But the reality is you download it. Uh, it is a Trojan, and the... Uh, criminals will get control of your computer, basically. And that's the long and the short of it. So yeah. uh, anything that claims to be a chat GTPT desktop client, at least for now, ignore, do not click, do not download, um, and just steer well clear. The only way you can use it is in your browser. We move on to that part of the show now where we bring you a recommendation. This is a look at uh, something that we have um, enjoyed or experienced over the past few days. My recommendation this week is a piece of hardware called the Firewall of Purple SE. It's a compact hardware device that acts as a firewall offering deep packet inspection, ad blocking and VPN features. There are three ways you can use this. You can connect it directly to your router and then the traffic goes in the router to the firewall and then back into the router and then around your house. Um, you can also use it uh, more or less sort of um, in between your router and your internet connection or in between the computer and the router. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's It has three configurations modes. Uh, so basically a router mode, a simple DHCP mode, and a transparent bridge mode. Um, I've used it for a couple of weeks recently. One of the things that most interesting about it is that it will detect pretty much everything um, and then alert you as if it's anything that shouldn't be accessed. But also the mobile app is so incredibly detailed and has so many menu options uh, that, I mean, I could, I wrote a review on the um, Firewall of Purple SE, which you can check out at makeuseof.com. I actually took it to the Leeds Armouries to take some photos as well. Um, so if you spot some interesting photos on there, think, oh, that's a curious background. Um, that, that's what I've done. But most importantly, I would recommend this piece of kit because of the three configurations. It, co it does cost $249. It's uh, around the same in uh, GBP as well. But it protects your network from cyber attacks. It deep packet inspects data, blocks unwanted ads, although not all, curiously. Um, it has a built-in VPN server and VPN uh, client support, so you can use either OpenVPN, set up your own VPN server with it, or use um, a VPN that you currently subscribe to. Uh, it has automatic DNS over HTTPS and uh, parental control and web filtering. If you have a family or a small business and you want to control what online content quote unquote is um accessed then i would recommend either the firewall of purple se or the the straightforward firewall of purple which is a slightly more expensive one it's really really good i'm seriously impressed with it sounds it looks brilliant i have to say the purple is like yes that's excellent <laughs> is the the parental controls and stuff fairly easy to use then yeah they are it alerts you on everything you can turn the alerts off but by default it alerts everything uh, i think you can see in the screenshots where it's showing me gaming activity um it will show activity from adverts as well so it can be slightly confusing 
in one of the screenshots, for example, uh, it's got listed my notebook is playing games on gamesnostalgia.com. But gamesnostalgia.com isn't a gaming site. It is a games news site. Oh, I see. It's picked up like an advert or something. Yeah, it's picked up an advert or a, or a meta tag or whatever and qualified yeah. it as gamer. Res- exactly. Actually, I was just reading. So there can be some misnomers like that, but otherwise it's pretty good. You'd perhaps rather be sort of slightly over notified in terms of um, security and especially parental control rather than it missing things. At least then you can configure it to be like actually no, um, rather yeah, rather than it missing things. So that's that's very cool. I like the look of that. Yeah, I was impressed with it. So what have you got, Gavin? Uh, I have uh, some earbuds actually that I have also been reviewing. (laughs) Unfortunately, I get sent a lot of earbuds. So (laughs) in my life, uh, all I have is earbuds. (laughs) It's the same pair, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, just over and over again. Um, Actually, I do have a a small sad note actually before uh, I get into my recommendation. Is something I'd previously recommended, uh, which is the custom PC mag. Um, which was a a print magazine available in the UK and I believe in the US um, with a subscription. Um, Last month or a couple of weeks back, they sent me in the post a cheque for my remaining subscription to the print magazine. Oh, they're they're cancelling. They're cancelling their print subscription and they're going online only. So um, that is something I had previously recommended. And I will continue to recommend their online offerings because it's really good. But uh, I really enjoyed getting an actual print magazine in the month uh, in in the mail each month yeah all relating to pcs and what have you so, so that, is, that's a, it's a shame is it going to be um is it is there going to be a pdf version of it yeah there already is a pdf and so the, uh, the pdf that. version is is yeah the pdf version is completely free as well so you yeah. only had to pay for the print version i don't know if they're going to switch now to a subscription version on their website but um yeah sad when uh, print magazines go out of business well out of print yeah especially yeah. ones that are relatively niche but i mean it's it's also understandable because it is so niche but um yeah that is a shame yeah sad so anyway there. these earbuds well, these earbuds right these earbuds they're called the final z8000 uh, i have just reviewed them for makeuseof.com i've given them a 9.5 rating whoa hang on a minute hang on <laughs> not the one i exactly. wanted but anyway wow no no we'll take it we'll take it they are uh <laughs> exceptional um they come with a pretty premium price tag they are 300 dollars. <gasps> i thought mine um, were expensive yeah these uh they're pretty expensive but they're also incredibly incredibly good so final are a japanese audio company uh they've got a a reputation for very very high quality audio they released some earbuds which we also reviewed uh last year uh and they the previous ones were their first ever wireless earbuds uh these new ones are a step above those by far they are some of the best earbuds i've ever had the pleasure of reviewing the shape of them is like nothing else <laughs> you've seen <laughs> so instead of um like the regular like the two main regular types of earbuds right you have you know like your in-ear one that sits right in your ear and yeah. it's like a round blob basically and then you'd have like your ear stem one which is like your, your airpods something like that don't you These ones are sort of a mixture of both. So you've got the blob that goes in your ear and then instead of like an ear stem that goes sort of down below your ear lobe, it has more of a baton at the rear of them that sits sort of alongside your ear. It's quite hard to imagine, but the design of them is is completely unique. You won't see anything like this anywhere else. Um, And the sound quality is, is just, it's phenomenally good. They are a beautifully balanced set of earbuds that 
once you pop them in and you get them comfy and get a nice seal on them, they they just sound amazing. They also come with something right called uh, 8K sound. Now this is interesting. So I'd never even heard of this before. Um, getting these earbuds and 8K sound um, in their words upgrades the digital signal processing algorithm to a higher level so it basically takes the audio and makes it sound even better than it can do uh, the issue with it is is that if you're already using quite high quality audio it's quite hard to hear the differences but it's uh, it's an interesting feature to have nonetheless um, and also the other thing I'll say is the the ANC on them is also quite good so you get a good amount of um, active noise cancellation Wow 9.5 9.5. That is, uh, I mean, that that is, that, I mean, I don't think we've ever recommended anything so highly, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> they've got the editor's choice badge and everything. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. yeah. That yeah. is impressive. So, uh, yeah, so check those out. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's really useful podcast in which we've covered everything from uh, in incredible earbuds to uh, quite a bit of, actually, it's been quite a heavily uh, online security pace this week, <laughs> inexplicably. Everything we've discussed you'll find in the show notes. Uh, if we found if, if you found us useful in any way, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and we will be back for another show next week. Until then, it's bye from us. Bye.